Olaf, why do my pegs keep slipping? Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Ask Olaf the Violin Maker. Now, I missed last week because I was on holidays. Had an excellent time with the family, did lots of swimming, uh, visited some beautiful beaches, did some great hikes, and I'm back in the studio fully refreshed. So today I am actually going to talk to you from my workbench. Today I'm going to answer some more of your questions. I often get a whole lot of questions, so I'm going to try and answer some uh, in various shows. The first question from Nina. How do you fix pegs that are too loose, don't hold that tight in position when tuning? So when you have a violin the, um, and or an instrument and the pegs are slipping, it can be caused by a whole lot of different things. Now the first one is that if the pegs are working well, the strings might just not be wound on properly. So I always recommend that the strings are wound um, right up to the peg box here. You, you can see it. So you wind them really close to the peg box and that actually pulls in the peg towards the peg box and that can stop pegs from slipping. Um, the other thing that you could use to stop pegs from slipping is peg paste. Uh, sometimes makers will use a combination of peg paste, graphite and chalk and chalk will obviously make the pegs stick a little bit more uh, but it can also make them like click not very nicely. So peg uh, the peg paste is one of the best things that I use to make the pegs um, turn smoothly but still stick. Uh, the other thing that's the most important thing is that pegs need to fit 100% and they need to be 100% round. So if the pegs are slightly oval, so if you were to look at the side, uh, at the front of a peg like this, and uh, and it was actually slightly oval shaped and then the hull is also slightly oval shaped you would get sections where the pegs turn really easily and other sections where the pegs would turn really hard and that can also cause slippage so badly fitting pegs need to be refitted by a violin maker or a luthier then if you've got sometimes just a good service like peg service by a violin maker can really help you with that as well but sometimes it might just be the way the strings are wound on you basically mostly unwind this string and then you rewind it on making sure that the string sits extremely close to the peg box. And really well fitting pegs should just turn easily but the strings shouldn't slip. Another question, excuse me, why does my E string turn back? So I'm guessing that the E string is slipping and the answer would be very much the same as the peg question from earlier. So just make sure that the peg is in tight, that it fits well, that it turns easily and that the string is wound on right, like very close to the peg box and that should stop the E string from slipping. Okay, now this question is a big one, okay? So thank you, Alice and Tony for asking it. So the question is, I don't have a relationship with a luthier or violin maker in my area. Are there any questions you would ask a violin maker or luthier to make sure they know what they're doing before I have them service my expensive instrument because especially when you have a really good instrument you don't want just anyone working on it you'd really want a good trusted violin maker uh, one thing you can do is to uh, you know don't don't get them to do the big jobs first you know let them do something small first uh, but first you'd want to know that they've received proper training so you find out where they learned and how long they learned for. 
Um, so that's the first step. So you, they need to have either learned from a good violin making school or had an apprenticeship with a good violin maker that's already got a good reputation. So that's a good start. But what people do with their training obviously depends on them and their character. So, you know, some people come out of a violin making school and become an incredible violin maker and other people will just do very little about it. Like some won't even make violins after that and just play. I know quite a lot of people who've actually come out of violin making school and not pursued that career. So, you know, these are choices. And then also people have different levels of skills and and talent. So um, so a good thing to do is to try and get a few testimonials, you know, try and find out from reputable other reputable players that have had work done with them to uh, to see if you know if that's a trustworthy violin maker. Uh, you also need to make sure that they've had some experience, you know, sometimes you can come out of a violin making school and you have all the training and knowledge, but the maker doesn't actually have the experience yet. And, uh, and it's actually, you know, it, it takes, in my opinion, it takes about eight years of being a violin maker to, to kind of really be in a place where you can, um, where everything's really fluent. So you know, just make sure someone's been doing it for a while, that they have a good reputation. It's a bit hard to, I mean, you know, you've, you've got to also think about the violin makers and how they feel being asked those questions. Um, it's like, um, you know, when, when someone questions someone's talent, it, you know, it can make them feel not so good. But you obviously want the best for your instrument and yourself as well. But finding, getting testimonials from other players is probably one of the best things to do. And then just finding a general background. Quite often people write about their background training on their websites. And so you have a bit of an idea. It's just a really good question. It's, you know, it's something it's same. Like, how do you find a good car mechanic? Or, um, you know, or how do you find any good tradesperson? Because what someone says and what they does can be a big difference. Um, but yeah, in the testimonials, I think that's going to end up being the biggest thing. Um, just be careful that they're actually credible testimonials. There are testimonials and there are testimonials. And, uh, you know, it's like buying Instagram followers or something like that. You know, you can, you, you can actually... Um, get people to write, you know, some people will actually get people to write them testimonials. Um, but you can usually see, you can, yeah, you can usually read through it, you know, you're going to have to use your intuition a little bit as well. But if you're really worried, get the maker to do something smaller on your instrument first, don't get them to do the really big jobs, and try and find out from other people. The next question is actually a really good one. Um, and uh, it comes from Charles. Thank you so much, Charles, for writing in. And so the question is, I heard of teachers advising parents to buy strings that are available only in full size um, and cut them shorter. Is that even advisable? Wouldn't it change the tension of the strings and also the pressure over the bridge? And you're right. To get a certain tone, the, the string has a particular thickness. And that's why the G is a lot thicker than the E. And, um, and for the smaller sizes, they will actually make slightly thicker strings. Or they will change the tension a little bit on the strings. So that the string has the right amount of tension when you're playing it. And if you use a full size, say on the G especially, if you say you use a full size string on a quarter size instrument, that G is going to have way too little tension. It's gonna, it'll actually change pitch as you're bowing over because there's too little tension. And also, why would you cut down a full size string? So, so most string makers 
uh, make smaller size strings a lot cheaper than the full size strings. So why would you buy a more expensive string and then cut it down for an instrument? Um, so strings really are made for their size, so you have to be very careful. And especially when you're converting, say you're converting a violin to a viola for a smaller player, it's really important to get the C string in the right kind of tension. Uh, quite often, you know, on a small viola, you can actually use full-size violin strings for the three strings, the G, D, and A. But for the C, you want to make sure that you use the fractional size viola string to get that really nice tension on the C string. Um, so yes, very important to buy the right size string for the right uh, instrument. Uh, thanks for the question. That's actually a really good one. Yeah, it's actually been really nice being on holidays and when I Usually when I come back from holidays, I get super enthusiastic about my work again It's uh, sometimes it's good to you know, just take a little bit of time away and at the moment I'm actually working on my new violin here and It's getting quite close to being finished. So I've got to do some work uh, on the on the ribs here. I've got to put the lining in and then I'm just about ready to glue on my top plate. So I am super excited um, The other thing too is I've been restoring a couple of old instruments So I've got this this old English instrument. Uh, it's it's an interesting one because it's it's got this beautiful stamp in the back uh, make a stamp and and the year uh, so 1885 is the year that the instrument was made so that's beautiful having been able to restore that and it actually sounds really nice so um, I'm gonna take it's gonna be a lot of fun just playing it but I just finished it in the last couple of days and the other project that I'm doing apart from some repair work uh, the other project I'm doing is I'm restoring this old Nicola violin uh, it's actually had a number of um, yeah I had to repair a few cracks um, a, a lot of the gluing had come apart so I had to re-glue a lot of things it must have just been left in a um, you know, maybe in an attic or something like that. This instrument's actually from around 1820, and uh, I seriously doubt that it's actually been played for the last hundred years. Like, oh, I don't think it's even been touched since, uh, you know, the early 1900s or something like that. But it's a beautiful violin. It's, it's. I'm getting very close to uh, getting it finished. I've already cut the bridge for it. Um, I'm going to use some of the more original pegs. I'm very excited to hear the first tones coming out of this violin, yeah, you know, after probably over a hundred years of not having been played. So it's my very exciting project. Uh, that instrument's going to be for sale soon too, so that's, that'll be nice. Actually, the other project I'm doing is I'm um, restoring this old violin here and uh, it's it's had a lot of cracks you can see by all the reinforcements uh, so um, it's an old German violin from the um, late 1700s uh, possibly probably the turn of the century maybe late 1700s early 1800s and uh, I'm yeah that it'll be um, it's a really fun project as well it's had a lot of cracks uh, it's had a sound post crack and quite a few um, yeah big big amounts of damage but it's uh, it's very special to the player and uh, the owner who is I think in her 90s or turning 90 so uh, so I'm hoping to get it finished in time for um, a birthday um, and that'll be that'll be very exciting it's a project I'm enjoying as well okay so to the next question um, I've rested my violin for about 10 years and this week when I actively watch your channel I'm starting to look after my violin by myself uh, what I want to ask uh, is it possible that the strings are still okay after 10 years first thought was to replace the strings uh, it's also really hard to tune and it's always back out of tune after tuning it in minutes. So are the pegs okay too, or do I need to replace them too? So what I would do, if you haven't played your instrument for 10 years, 
I would seriously consider going to a violin maker and getting it checked out. Um, what can happen over 10 years is firstly that the bridge can get bent uh, because, you know, it, it may have been sitting on there crookedly and it could, could be bent. Also, the sound post could be in the wrong place. Uh, I would most definitely change the strings. After 10 years, the strings will lose their brilliance, so you'll miss that. And also, the pegs uh, probably just need servicing. So if the pegs fit well, they probably just need a service. Um, so, and, and you might want to get the instrument polished after 10 years, uh, just clean and polished because uh, it'll just make it work so much better. Of course, it all depends on your budget. You can probably clean it yourself just with a dry cloth. I'm not a huge fan of violin cleaners, but on cheaper instruments, I'm okay with it. Um, a lot of more expensive instruments, I would not touch the varnish with, uh, with um polishes because um, it can actually d dissolve some of the varnish and do some damage. Also, if the instrument had cracks, the, the, um, the, um, the polish can actually seep into the cracks and reopen them. And that can, you know, open a Pandora's box of bigger repairs and things like that. But if I was you, if, I haven't, if you haven't played your violin for 10 years, get it checked over. It's definitely worth it. You know, it's... Uh, you can do a little bit of checking yourself, but uh, but in the long run, you're better off actually getting getting it checked by a professional violin maker. Anna commented, uh, "My violin makes a horrible sound, but it's not the violin's fault." Anna, keep practicing. You'll get there. Okay, all it takes is practice, and uh, and having fun. So you too can make beautiful music. Okay, so there's a comment. My violin says conservatory behind the snail. I think by snail it means the scroll. What does that mean? So um, there were a lot of instruments made from the early 1800s to the mid 1900s. And um, they did all sorts of things. They marked them in all sorts of different ways. And one of the marking was conservatory instrument to try and give it a, a little bit of a higher level. But they actually stamped or carved that in into the scroll of the instrument. Uh, it won't make it a much better instrument. It would have still been mass produced. But but some of those old German or uh, bohemian instruments, which, uh, which are now on the Czech Republic side, but at the time it was part of Germany um, well uh, you know it can be really nice instruments and you can end up with a really beautiful old instrument with a nice tone uh, but you've got to be careful they some of them have been really badly made and really quickly made so you know you just got to pick the good one last question what is the difference between metal nylon and gut strings so the difference is sound so metal strings are much more high tension strings. They'll have quite a clear tone, but it can be a bit too much, especially on the violin. It might work okay if you're playing um, folk music or rock music, but usually for classical music or jazz, um, nylon or gut is the best. And, and I highly recommend nylon. I mean, they've developed some really beautiful nylon strings these days. And most professional players use nylon. Gut strings can break a little bit. They're also susceptible to weather. So gut um, actually shrinks when it's dry and expands when it's humid. So it'll actually change pitch. And that can be really frustrating, especially if you're in a concert. But they do have that really beautiful, um, gentle sound and, and, and have like this, oh, it's, it's hard to describe. It's like a buttery, beautiful sound. And uh, and that's, that can be hard to emulate with, even with nylon strings. So there's a type of sound that you get with gut strings that you can't get from other strings. Uh, but you've got that payoff with the, um, you know, they're difficult to tune, they go out of tune quickly, they break quickly, and they're super expensive. So expensive strings that break quickly, you know, aren't necessarily a good combination. Uh, 
if you are trying to save money. But they are very different sounding strings, and uh, but most of them are metal wound anyway, so, so even the gut strings, there's very few raw gut strings. Raw gut strings still get used to make baroque and period music, but um, for violin and viola, most of the good strings are nylon strings. And for cello, there are some good nylon strings, but there are um, most of the really good strings are actually steel strings. And especially for the C and the G, for cello, uh, quite often they use tungsten, and, and that just gives that really nice, brilliant tone, as well as having that kind of cello-y, beautiful cello -y richness. Double bass is actually, uh, for a lot of double basses, nylon is good again, um, because it, it, it has that kind of gentler tone that you're looking for in double bass. Anyway, that's it for me. I will do the other string video. Um, I've got a few videos to do about strings. I've just, uh, having come back from holidays, I've had so many questions, so I just thought I'd take the time to answer some of your questions. Um, love to hear your comments, questions, memes, whatever. Um, I'll try and comment on them in other videos. So anyway, um, keep playing, keep practicing, keep making beautiful music, and have fun when you're playing. Just, just enjoy it, you know. Sometimes people get so caught up in, in, in just trying to get one part exactly right and getting it in tune. But you know, in the end, it's more important that you focus on making beautiful music. Okay, your posture and practice are important, but also have fun. Otherwise, if you're not having fun, then, uh, you know, why play? So anyway, have lots of fun playing. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, click the like button. If, uh, if you want to find out when I'm posting the next video, make sure you subscribe. Uh, hit the little bell so you find out as soon as I post my next video. Okay, thanks for watching guys. See you next time. Bye.